Next on Currents News, emergency contraceptives available from vending machines. The growing national trend is now reaching New York. A real life Christmas Grinch stealing decorations like these from Brooklyn residents. I'm Tim Hartman and I'll have the story. An unexpected decision in a Washington courtroom. Michael Flynn was there to be sentenced, but after a heated hearing, a surprise decision. He didn't stop. He didn't miss a beat. A heartbroken mom outraged by the homily delivered at her son's funeral. The story is sparking a national discussion and the news starts right now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Faubless. Emergency contraception, the so-called morning after pill, available to college students through vending machines. It's very controversial with pro-life supporters and happening now in New York. Currents News' Emily Druby is here with the latest developments. Emily. Liz, the idea behind the machines stocked with the morning after pill is to eliminate the need for students to go to a pharmacy or a health service professional vending machines, but instead of chips or soda, they sell emergency contraception, also known as the morning after pill. The machines already in place at schools across the country, including Columbia University in New York. I definitely seen them and like it was really a big hype when they first put them in. It was really good to have those resources right there on campus. Now Barnard College, a liberal arts women's college also in Manhattan that has a partnership with Columbia University, plans on installing one of the vending machines outside their primary care service center. I think it's really great that Barnard is actually providing options and uh, in a way that is non-discriminatory and people can really access this without shame. The new trend is very controversial with pro-life groups. Alice Lemos, the secretary of the Bridge to Life, a charity that helps women in crisis pregnancies, explains this distribution method could cause problems. We don't know what the long-term effects of high doses of hormones is, and also we're making it more and more difficult for young women to say no. We're saying in essence that a pill solves every problem, and it doesn't. Lemos further explaining she believes the vending machine pushes women further away from just saying no. It's not bubble gum. We're talking about high doses of hormones. I think it's terrible that the campuses are encouraging bad behavior. Just saying no actually does work. The vending machines already set up at Columbia University are located in building lobbies. The pills sell for $40 in our machines along with items like tampons and Advil. In a statement to Currents News, Barnard College said after assessing student need and evaluating best practices among our peer institutions, we decided to install vending machines to ensure students would have access to a range of over-the-counter medications, including emergency contraception at hours when pharmacies may be closed and they have the need. Columbia University has yet to respond to our request for comment. According to the Wall Street Journal, the vending machines already exist at many colleges, including Stanford and Dartmouth. Oh my goodness, Emily, when are these machines supposed to be up and running at Barnard specifically? It'll be very soon. Uh, they're hoping to have them ready sometime during the upcoming spring semester. All right, Emily, thank you so much. Tonight, police are hunting for a Grinch on the prowl in Brooklyn. Currents News' Tim Harfman reports on a thief who's stealing Christmas from the front lawns of residents in Kensington. Brooklyn residents and the NYPD searching for a Scrooge. As I see something, I say something. Surveillance video captured a Christmas criminal ruining a holiday display on East 4th Street in Kensington. It shows an individual with a backpack looking up the street, then walking into a driveway, climbing the gate and stealing an inflatable reindeer decoration. The homeowner didn't want to show his face or give his name. But he did talk about the latest crime and how his house has been hit before. The summertime he stole, what do you call it, a hummingbird spinner. I didn't report it to police. Then for Thanksgiving he stole the, the turkey. I didn't report it to police. The third time he came and he stole the reindeer and I thought that was too far now. The reindeer was stolen on December 4th. Then last week the thief tried to take another decoration. But the homeowner was prepared. His inflatable chains of the house. He says he doesn't care how much decorations cost. He's worried about safety. I'm concerned one day that maybe I'll come in and I'll catch him in the house. I don't know what will happen then. Across the street, a neighbor had string Christmas lights stolen. He bought new ones. I think it's very low. I think it's very cheap. 
It's the greatest country in the world. Why does people get so, have to get down so low? Sonia walks her five-year-old dog Shiloh. She enjoys the decor, but upset by what's happening in her neighborhood. I like to see the Christmas stuff on the nighttime when I'm walking my dog, you know, and that's not nice that people are selling stuff. These residents have a message for the real-life Grinch. Don't do it because maybe you don't have a nice Christmas, but uh, other people want to have it, a nice Christmas. Don't grow old, grow up. Although residents are upset about their Christmas decorations, they tell me the thief can't deflate their Christmas spirit. In Kensington, Brooklyn, Tim Harfman, Currents News. The investigation remains ongoing and the NYPD asks that anyone with information contact Crime Stoppers at 800-577-TIPS or send a text to crimes, then enter TIP 577. Pope Francis is again putting the church in direct opposition to the death penalty. At the Vatican with members of an international commission against capital punishment, Francis said every life is sacred and must be guarded without exception. And he also criticized lifetime prison sentences because they offer no chance of redemption. The former governor of New Mexico, Bill Richardson, was with the pontiff. When I abolished the death penalty in New Mexico, it wasn't popular. But the American people are moving in favor of abolition. Although not totally, it's something like 55-45. But if the Pope takes a stand with the Catholic community, especially in the U.S., that's going to help persuade Catholic voters in many states. The U.N. is adopting a resolution to eliminate the death penalty worldwide. National correspondent for the Tablet and Crux, Christopher White, joins us now to talk about the changing attitudes toward capital punishment. Christopher, thank you, as always, for being here. You know what? Pope Francis has spoken repeatedly about his opposition to the death penalty. Why is this issue just so close to him? Listen, I think if we think back to Pope Francis's early years as a priest and then a bishop in, in Buenos Aires, Prison ministry was actually sort of at the top of his list, so I think it was really from spending time with inmates and, and their families that he saw firsthand what he would describe as the evils of this practice. And I think that sort of led him over the years to kind of speak out consistently on this issue and kind of place it front and center for Catholics worldwide. Now, since this summer's announcement that he was officially changing the catechism to be against capital punishment, what's been the reaction of, of Catholics throughout the United States? You know, there have been some Catholics, particularly conservative Catholics, who have been critical of the Pope's uh, decision to, you know, declare the death penalty inadmissible. Uh, but for the most part, Catholics, uh, as well as the rest of the country, have sort of continually moved uh, uh, against this issue uh, and sort of see this as a, a practice that they want to distance themselves from. It doesn't mean there hasn't been opposition in some quarters. Uh, but on the whole, Catholics have been supportive of this. Now we've done our research. Obviously, we've seen the data. The death penalty is on decline, according to some reports. Now, do you think Catholic advocacy on this issue is partly responsible for that decline? Yeah, I, I look at states across the country where I see this issue sort of coming up, and, and certainly Catholics are on the front lines. I think of Sister Helen Prejean, who's probably the, the most famous advocate yeah. in this country, and she is normally the ones going and knocking on the doors of governors, particularly Catholic governors, and saying, uh, you know, as a Catholic, uh, you really shouldn't be endorsing this practice. So uh, certainly a loud voice there. Now, Christopher, really quickly, despite the decline of, of public support, support for capital punishment, neither of the political parties have found a unified voice. Why? Well, look, I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, there's bipartisan support for the death penalty and there's bipartisan opposition to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it is mixed across the board. Uh, but it's one of those issues where you, you have, uh, you know, a growing number of legislators that see this as something they don't want to identify with, as a number of countries in the world have stopped the practice. Uh, so we'll perhaps see a, a growing trend in that direction. And I think we have not heard the last of this discussion. Perhaps so I look not. forward to talking with you about it again. Thank you so much, Chris. Christopher. The National Institute of Health is under fire tonight by America's bishops. The clerics are condemning the use of body parts of aborted babies for research and the agency's defense of the practice. The bishops are saying, quote, the remains of aborted babies are human remains and should be given the full respect they deserve. Such research is morally offensive. A big surprise in Washington at the sentencing of Michael Flynn, the highest ranking official to be charged in connection to the Russia investigation. There was no sentencing. Instead, there was an animated court hearing. Karen Kafa reports.
After drama in a D.C. federal courtroom Tuesday, Michael Flynn exiting the court with his sentencing unexpectedly postponed until at least March, his attorneys taking up an offer from the judge. Judge Emmett Sullivan had harsh words for Flynn, telling him, I am not hiding my disgust, my disdain for your criminal offense, and seeming to suggest he would end up behind bars. I think Flynn's lawyers felt that Flynn was going to get jail because the judge felt that this was so serious that notwithstanding the substantial cooperation, he was going to get jailed. So they're hoping now for this timeout to delay jail. Special counsel Robert Mueller's team cited Flynn's broad cooperation with their investigation and at least one other Justice Department probe recommending a light sentence or even no prison time at all. Flynn pleaded guilty last December to lying to the FBI about conversations during the Obama-Trump transition with then-Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak. President Trump fired him in February 2017, at the time, he said, because he lied to the vice president. Tuesday, the White House tried to keep up their argument that none of it has anything to do with the president. The activities that he has said to, and I'll, again, we'll let the court make that determination, to have engaged in don't have anything to do with the president. In their sentencing memo, Flynn's team criticized FBI agents who interviewed him on January 24, 2017, saying they did not advise that lying to them would be a federal crime. Flynn on Tuesday, however, said he did know that at the time and accepted responsibility. In Washington, Karen Kafa, Currents News. The Trump Foundation is going out of business. The president's charity is agreeing to dissolve under court supervision. The move comes as the New York State Attorney General's office investigates the organization's finances. The AG is also seeking millions of dollars in restitution and penalties against the foundation. The criminal justice reform bill that has strong Catholic backing is a step closer to becoming law. The Senate broke a filibuster against the legislation by a wide bipartisan margin. The measure is called the First Step Act and gives some prison inmates a faster path to release through rehabilitation programs. A vote to approve the bill could be held before the Christmas break. Pope Francis is releasing a new set of Beatitudes for 21st century politicians. There are a total of eight, and they include blessed be the politician who works for the common good, who exemplifies credibility, who works for unity, and who is capable of listening. The Holy Father stressed that politics must be used to pursue the common good rather than private interest. There's a lot more news headed your way. The homily in the headlines. A priest speaks about a young man who committed suicide. Major controversy follows. Bishop DiMarzio is sharing the video from his regional meetings with the lay faithful of the Diocese of Brooklyn and Queens regarding the clergy sex abuse crisis. And why this 93-year-old vet has been visiting a cemetery early in the morning nearly every day for five years. Do you have a story idea, something happening in your parish we should know about? We want to hear from you. Keep this email handy. News tips at the salesmedia.org. We'll be right back. A Buffalo priest has been cleared of sexual misconduct allegations and returned to active ministry after an investigation in the upstate diocese. Monsignor Fre Frederick Lysing was accused of forcibly kissing a woman 30 years ago when she was 19. Following the probe, the suspension of the priest was lifted. Monsignor Lysing said, quote, I'm happy with the way things turned out and I really hold no animosity toward the woman who accused him. A priest preached at the funeral of a young man in Detroit. What the clergyman said has prompted a church apology and sparked a national discussion about how to handle suicide. The Archdiocese of Detroit is apologizing tonight after a homily at a teen's funeral turned into a lecture on why suicide is a sin. In a statement, the Archdiocese said, We understand that an unbearable situation was made even more difficult and we are sorry. After some reflection, the presider agrees that the family was not served as they should have been served. For the foreseeable future, he will not be preaching at funerals. I don't want to see him do that to anybody else, what he did to us. Jeff and Linda Hullabarger had spoken to the priest who delivered the heartbreaking homily beforehand. When the parents sat down with Father Don LaCuesta about their son Mason's funeral arrangements, they said they wanted to focus on the 18-year-old's life and not how he passed. But when Father LaQuesta stood in the pulpit, a different message came out. He basically called our son a sinner 
in front of hundreds of people and judged him when he didn't even know him. When Father LaCuesta began to preach about the evils of suicide, the family was shocked. Jeff Hullabarger tried to intervene. Asked him to stop. Um, I didn't make a scene. I did it respectfully. He didn't stop. He didn't miss a beat. According to the Hullabargers, after Father LaQuesta's homily, they were able to speak and honor their son the way they always wanted, by remembering his life. He was at University of Toledo. Um, he was a freshman and criminal justice was all A's. He enjoyed life. Now, the Archdiocese says the priest will undergo training on becoming a more effective minister. Here to dig further into this controversy is Father John Gribowich. He is a priest at St. Charles Borromeo Church in Brooklyn Heights and works in the communication ministry at NetTV's parent company, DeSales Media. Father John, this is going to be a difficult one because it's a sensitive issue, right? Sure. We're not here to point fingers, but we can discuss that the priest ministering to the grieving family at the son's funeral probably could have taken a different approach. We'll, be, we'll, we'll take it from there. Now, the archdiocese, I have to say this, they admit that the tone of the homily did not reflect the family's wishes or, or their, their, their desires. How should it have been handled? Sure. I mean, thinking about this, and of course, I don't know all the particulars of actually what happened mm -hmm. with the family and everything, but I think that the best course of action here would be how you would handle any funeral homily. I mean, the goal at a funeral homily is to not underestimate or not to underemphasize uh, the mercy and love of God. Okay. And like, that's the key thing. That's the main message that comes at any funeral homily. Uh, on the same token, we're not there to canonize the person saying that they are a saint, right? Okay. Uh, now, that, but that's the course of action for any funeral. Right? And so you're always dealing with that balance. I don't think that most families are expecting the priest to give like a eulogy at the homily uh, because they're usually as, pe as people who actually know the person mm -hmm. who would do that. Uh, so I think that maybe in, in the, this situation, Is that that's where the line might have been crossed? It, it, it became a eulogy rather than a homily. Right. I mean, uh, of course, it's very important to personalize a homily at a funeral. I, I think that the more information you know about the person, the mm -hmm. better to emphasize essentially how they have revealed God's love in their life. So that's a way to kind of continue the theme of emphasizing mm -hmm. God's love. So that's th what you touch upon. But, I mean, we all have our faults and we all have our weaknesses, so no one's perfect either. So mm -hmm. we can't say that everything the person has done was just perfectly How reflection How much of that. should theology play a role uh, in the homily at a funeral? Are there certain guidelines that uh, priests should follow to balance out theology and speaking personally from the heart? Right. I mean, I think a funeral homily is one where you have a very captive audience, so to speak, mm -hmm. a very captive congregation. Uh, because I think everyone there, while they may be thinking about this particular person and what happened to this particular person, uh, you cannot help but think about your own mortality at a funeral when you go to a funeral. And that's why I think people are really hanging on to what the priest can say. So I think that a very good, clear understanding of the nature of who God is in relationship to us and the nature of our lives, that has to be the main theme that's coming through in the homily. I have to get this in, Father John. Now, we are taught that God is merciful and God is just. Now, how God judges a person at the end of their life with a death by suicide, at least for me, is a mystery. Should the church or anyone judge the way a person has died? It's impossible to judge a person uh, because we don't know fully why a person acts the way they act. None of us can judge a person. It's true that we could judge actions as whether they are, are objectively good or bad. I mean, I think we would all would agree that murder is objectively a bad action. But to judge the person who actually commits murder is something that we, can't do, we can never do because we don't know all the factors, the psychological, the upbringing, all the other you know, cultural context of, of why a person does what they do. So it's extremely important for us that we never judge the person. We can judge a sin, an objective, mm -hmm. you know, objective action. Uh, but we can never judge a person. All right, Father John, thank you so much for, for putting some perspective to what is a very difficult situation. I thank appreciate you, it. Thank you.
Bishop DiMarzio is sharing the video of four regional meetings he held with parishioners in Brooklyn and Queens regarding the clergy sex abuse crisis. With all the negative headlines in the news, I feel compelled to speak to you directly about all the Diocese of Brooklyn does to protect children and to help victims heal. The video runs more than an hour and Bishop DiMarzio answers questions from the faithful of the diocese. In total, he met with over a thousand parish leaders. The video is available on the diocese Facebook page at facebook.com slash Brooklyn Diocese slash videos. Still to come on Currents News, the heartwarming reason why a 93-year-old World War II veteran visits a cemetery almost every single morning. And the Bright Christmas Campaign needs your help tonight. A great initiative run by the tablet newspaper and donations make Christmas a more joyous time for children in need. Please write your checks to Bright Christmas and send them to 1712 10th Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11215. And that address is also posted on our website, netny.tv slash shows slash Currents News. A 93-year-old World War II veteran spends most mornings at a cemetery visiting his one true love. Jim Mendoza has the report. Like clockwork, Ted Richardson arrives at the Veterans Cemetery at Punchbowl to visit Florence Richardson's grave. Six days a week, no matter the weather, he is there. I always tell him when I go up there, uh, payback time. Ted uses payback as a term of endearment. You see, he was 16 and Florence just 14 when they first met in their Pennsylvania town in 1941. And I went home and told my daddy that night, I saw the girl I was going to marry. He said, what's her name? I said, I don't know. He enlisted in the Marines and fought through World War II. Her photograph went with him everywhere. They married after the war. Florence worked for the FBI and Ted became a school teacher. They were married for 72 years until she passed away five years ago. I owe her that much for 72 years. She lost her temper only once in 72 years and that was my fault. That's what he means when he calls the visits payback. They are thank yous with flowers. And I use mini carnations because when you first put them in, they're just buds. And then about three days later, they open up. It takes Ted three bus rides from his Waikiki apartment to reach the foot of the cemetery where security staffers drive him up the hill. Since her burial at Punchbowl, Ted's visited Florence's grave more than 1,300 times. They say, how do you keep track? Well, I have calendars and I mark them down every day when I come home. Ted's 93 years old and he has planned ahead. I'll keep going as long as I can go. God will tell me when I, I've had enough. He arranged with his church to bring Florence flowers once a month when he's dead and buried beside her. Oh, there is not a dry eye in this house. What an undying love. That is Currents News. I'm Liz Faubless. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. I hope to see you again next time.